Uh, our next speaker is going to be William Kramer, who's going to talk about environmental assessment and uh, outer space stuff. William? Yeah, good morning. Hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm calling in from uh, Frederick, Maryland, where we're expecting 12 inches of snow on Wednesday. So that'll be the beginning of winter for us. Um, I hope that you all had a chance to see my video um, that was posted. And um, for those of you in the US, stay six feet back from your screens. And if you're in Europe, stay back two meters um, so we can all stay safe. Um, basically, what my talk was is that I realized um, about six years ago that we're quickly moving into a phase of space exploration um, where there will be increasing impacts to extraterrestrial environments and that this is um, abundantly foreseeable and near term. And by near term here, I'm referring to a couple of decades. So the issue is rapidly evolving um, where the actions that we do on the moon, Mars and beyond will affect those environments potentially in adverse ways that will foreclose future opportunities the same way that um, actions here on earth uh, have those kinds of impacts, both adverse impacts and uh, more permanent impacts as well. Currently, there is no requirement for either industries or governments to consider their environmental impacts for space actions beyond uh, low earth orbit. Um, and I think that's gonna become increasingly important because adverse impacts could, uh, again, block future use of those areas or not use them to their best capacity. And the reason that this is an issue that's pertinent to SOCIA is because our relationship with our environment, of course, here on earth has been a critical component of social development and social structure. And when we change our environment, we affect our social systems in the long run. And that would also be true on Mars and beyond. So if we are planning on eventually um, living, even if um, whether permanent or short-term on these extraterrestrial areas, um, we should establish relationships with the environment that are positive and be cautious of environmental damages that will affect social systems. So far, most of our um, interactions with extraterrestrial environments have been um, uh, of relatively minor influence to those environments, but uh, over the next coming decades, that could change dramatically, especially with proposals for mining and um, uh, large energy production facilities, landing, launching facilities, human habitation, and a whole range of uh, activities. And so far, our relationship with areas like Mars, if you look at the language that we use when we talk about relationships with environments, you hear very commonly hear things like Mars is a hostile environment. Well, what does that mean? It means that if Mars is hostile, then that gives us a right to abuse it. And that language, although there's a little less of it now, um, it still pops up when you would least expect it. Uh, so it's good to be on guard of that. So back here in the US, um, neither NASA nor any other agency has any kind of requirement for assessing environmental impact. And uh, environmental impact statements are done for programs like the Marge Exploration Program, but they're confined to just Earth and near Earth environments and um, specifically do not address impacts to extraterrestrial areas. So that's an issue that uh, I would like to see change. And there's two ways to go about this, uh, at least. One is first, which is hard law, where governments or international groups get together uh, through treaties and come up with some kind of protocol. And I believe that's unlikely given the um, current policies of uh, US government and most other governments, especially in the US, both under um, uh, 
the Obama and Trump and likely Biden administrations, there is going to be a push to encourage uh, exploitation of these resources, not restrict them. So a second uh, way that I am advocating as more practical solution is self-regulation by the industries involved, uh, science interests and other proposed actions. And this would be through the industries themselves getting together and formulating best management practices, codes of conduct, industrial standards, and similar measures that they will um, structure, they will monitor, they will um, punish uh, industries that are not in compliance. <clears throat> and uh, that would be a good first step towards addressing this problem. And these are common practices among industries here on earth and have been for a couple of centuries. And so I think that using that model and applying that to outer space would be um, the best way to go. So um, I think best to, to stop there and go to Q and A and uh, hopefully uh, get into some of these issues. Thank you. Okay, Caleb, I saw you first. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And my question is whether, um, if whether my view of the value of the environment changes your position. So if if I think that whether or not I think the environment is valuable intrinsically or instrumentally, like does that change your position? Because I could see like if I think the environment only has an instrumental value to produce and maintain well-being in conscious creatures, then I, I don't really see why I should care so much about preserving the natural environment of Mars if the only creatures there are um, non-sentient bacteria, for example. So I'm wondering, like, why, why should we really care about the environments of extraterrestrial um, places at all if... Um, the only reason for maintaining them would be sort of this intrinsic value that they might have. And you can make that argument, but like, are you going to be able to convince someone who only views environments as having this sort of instrumental value? Well, if, if you look back at human history here on earth and relationships with the environment, first, um, I'll, I'll just state that, uh, these assumptions are, let's assume that, that Mars is, has no, um, uh, endemic life, uh, no, no life of its own. We'll, we'll assume that, that takes care of uh, a huge range of arguments. Um, still, if humans are going to be living there, then it'll have both instrumental and intrinsic value. Um, certainly, uh, instrumental value would be our main reason for going there, because um, it's quite a expenditure to get there, you want something back for it. But I think if you look farther into the future where humans might be living their entire lives there um, or spending a significant part of their lives there, their relationship with that environment um, will grow. And if it is altered to such a state that it becomes, um, uh, what's the right word here? Anyway, if, if humans cannot relate to that environment, then it would decrease their, the value of um, being a human, I think, on that, uh, on that planet. For example, there would be um, no art in life <laughs> in such an environment. If you mil lived in the middle of an industrial zone as opposed to lived um, near mountains, uh, I think that would affect how you view only your environment, but how you view other people. Then other people might become only instrumental. Okay, um, a peak. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, actually, what I would like to say is that irrespective of whether a planet or moon or anything, uh, any uh, planetary body has life or not, I think we have to have a code of conduct for, you know, respecting for kind of uh, the, the integrity uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the landforms which have been created there, whether there is life or not. 
I mean, the geological uh, forms that have been created there, just like our mountains or valleys or whatever we have. And uh, I think uh, we don't have any right to indiscriminately, you know, destroy those landforms, whether they're, uh, you know, harboring life or not. So uh, just like we cannot uh, level all the mountains uh, on, on Earth, not only just because it's, uh, it will be bad for humans, but it's just for the sake of integrity of that. Here I'm just going to a bit of ecocentric thinking where we can give some intrinsic value and at least uh, uh, should strike a balance between how much we uh, modify and how much we conserve. And there should be some ratio, some code of conduct for that. Right, right. I agree. Okay, uh, Jim. Uh, really like the stuff you've been doing uh, on environmental impact, and I'm glad to see you're, you're continuing with it. And I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, how could this be given teeth? Because if you leave it entirely up to the private sector to dictate the terms of environmental impact, obviously there's that conflict of interest where they're going to uh, be be incentivized to you know underreport things. Right. Uh, to, to maybe not do the underlying legwork that would be needed to understand how uh, an impact event is going to, to cause uh, problems down the line, if so. Uh, and, you know, do you see that? Do you see any kind of, you know, uh, policy with stronger teeth being possible? Um, you know, because I worry that, you know, the, the, the deep sea mining uh, environmental impact is sort of suffering the same kind of issue where there's just not a lot of ability to enforce that they're actually doing a good job with the assessment in the first place. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a problem. Um, hard law is is a lot easier to uh, to get compliance than soft law. But I think the key here would be um, first of all, I'm proposing these are first steps just to to um, uh, advertise that this issue is foreseeable, and then I think. A couple of things that would encourage industries to do this. The first would be public relations, um, especially as profits begin to be made. I think it will be um, increasingly important that uh, population in the entire world uh, is going to be interested in this and they're going to be watching. And if an industry can show that it has taken an extra step to be concerned about the environment and be concerned about um, maintaining future options for the use of that environment, that the public will be much more supportive of their action, especially when they start to make a lot of money on it. Um, so that's one factor. The second, which is related, is that um, investors in space actions are going to want um, some assurance that uh, foreseeable costs will be addressed before they are willing to invest in a project. So again, if a uh, company like SpaceX decides to go in and start mining on the moon or Mars and is looking for investors, if they can say, um, we've also considered impacts to the moon and we know that there's subsurface ice in this area, so we won't be going there. I think that helps increase investor confidence. And then I think a third thing is that because space is so collaborative, where um, industries will be requiring cooperation, not only from governments, but other industries, as there are more and more of them working, that um, collaboration through this kind of a, an assessment process might increase or facilitate collaboration. So I think that's important. Um, if, for example, here on earth, we have um, industry groups like, and I'm making this up, but let's say the uh, International Federation of Metal Workers. I, I don't even know if there is such an organization. They might have standards and practices that are not enforced by any laws, but are industry standards. And if an industry starts ignoring those best practices, other industries are going to want to see them uh, get into line with standard practices. And they can do that through various industrial pressures or marketing. So um, 
it's definitely uh, what I'm what I'm looking at here is definitely not as firm as hard law, but I think it's a first step. And uh, these kinds of things could evolve into customary law, uh, like some actions on the high seas over the past centuries. And, uh, and that might be a benefit. Okay, Alan? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, William, I really found your presentation very interesting. And um, I guess, you know, I applaud your pointing to uh, these sort of soft law practices, but I'm also thinking that um, there may be a need for some hard law to, uh, and of course, those two are not mutually exclusive, you can pursue both. Uh, and what I'm wondering is, you know, here on Earth, you know, when we're doing environmental impact statements that's under the National Environmental Policy Act or, or NEPA, um, and I was curious as to whether NEPA itself might be able to play a role. Um, as I understand, it's, it's sort of a disputed uh, question whether NEPA applies to actions whose impacts occur entirely outside of the boundaries of the United States. Right. Um, but there's at least one interesting case I ran across a, 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 uh, an appellate court case of Environmental Defense Fund versus Massey that had to do with the construction of a uh, food waste incinerator in Antarctica. Uh, and in that case, the court held that even though the impacts were not affecting the United States because the decision process took place in the United States and there was federal involvement through NSF uh, that, that NEPA uh, could be applied. And so do you think NEPA could be applied to uh, impacts done by the US government, uh, you know, that would affect the moon or, or somewhere else? Yeah, the, the answer to that is yes, NEPA could apply. Um, there is nothing in NEPA that prohibits its application to extraterrestrial actions, but it's currently, um, of course, NEPA is administered through the uh, president's Council on Environmental Quality, which is nested right. under the executive branch in the White House. Currently, the um, head of that is Ted Bowling, and I, I spoke with him about this about a year ago, and he said that, um, yes, NEPA could apply, but the current administration and also in the Obama administration, it was determined that it would not apply there um, because uh, it's too restrictive. So it's a political issue. Now, uh, a future president could, could change that. I don't foresee that happening anytime soon, but there's nothing that would prohibit NEPA from applying. The other, the other shoe on that is that in the Carter administration, there was an executive order that's still in effect uh, called something like environmental effects abroad of federal actions. And that is similar to NEPA and that could be applied um, but so far it has not. Uh, as far as Antarctica, um, the President's Council on Environmental Quality has determined that NEPA does apply for Antarctica, but, um, but that's about it. Yeah. All right, well, we got, we got one minute left. So Catherine, if you can ask it real quick, I'll let you go. You're muted. Sure, yeah, it was more just an endorsement. and. Um, in terms of the discussions about, um, you know, intrinsic versus instrumental value and all of those things, those are obviously, you know, relevant and important things. But I think, from my perspective anyway, the priority right now has to go on looking at what's actually about to go down. <laughs> I mean, so mm -hmm. in, I, I th obviously those debates retain their importance, but I think in terms of who has the advantage at the moment and what the values being held by those players are um, in terms of, you know, solar system um, exploitation and colonization, I think any move to mitigate those potential impacts is just crucially important and more and more so every day. I don't think anybody needs at the moment to be asked, uh, you know, advocating the exploit side, um, just given where the power lies at the moment. That's yeah. my own view. Thank you very much, William, for an extremely pragmatic and helpful approach. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, cool. 